Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome to another edition of Inside Arsenal, the first of another week and the first of the week that includes Arsenal's pre-season tour of the USA. Arsenal are in the States right now. They have landed and those three games coming up against the All-Stars, against Manchester United and against Barcelona. Looking forward to seeing what we're going to learn during this trip. Mikel Arteta has taken a strong squad ahead of him. So we'll talk about that in today's video. We'll talk a little bit about Flo Balogun as more and more speculation uh, continues to surface about his future into Milan being heavily linked at the moment with an interest in Balogun following uh, Lukaku's the sort of collapse of their move for Lukaku at Chelsea. Uh, we'll talk about Kieran Tierney as well. Brendan Rodgers has been speaking about him and we'll answer some of your questions as usual to finish things off. But let's start by talking about the US tour. Now, Arsenal flew out yesterday. They announced their travelling squad. It's a strong squad. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it there. There are a couple of notable Addition, uh, not additions, sorry, uh, absences. However, Thomas Partey isn't there. Emil Smith Rowe isn't there. Now, Smith Rowe, we expected, probably was going to miss the start of it, but Arsenal have announced that he is going to fly out and link up, or they expect him to fly out and link up with the squad later on in the tour. And they've said the same for Thomas Partey as well. Now, this was quite interesting when he wasn't named in the squad because given everything that's going on around the Saudi league, I was expecting him to go. I thought yesterday, having spoken to someone quite close to Thomas Partey in the morning, that he was going to be travelling, but obviously he hasn't. But like Smith Rowe, Arsenal have said that he is going to link up with the squad next week. So it's um, a comment that certainly is kind of... I think had they not put that out, then there's going to be an awful lot of speculation about what's going on. Why isn't Thomas Partey... In the squad, he's obviously going. The fact that they're saying he's definitely going to fly out next week or they expect him to fly out next week has obviously stopped that speculation a little bit and he would be going out. I presume he must have some sort of an injury for him not to fly because obviously he played, played a part. He started the game in Germany. I thought he played well in that game against Germany. He's been training um, and the expectation was he was going to go. But it's, he must have picked something up, picked up a little niggle that is going to be worked on back at London Colney before flying out. So they, those two aren't going. No Nuno Tavares as well, like Smith Rowe. He'll be having a little bit of an extended holiday because of his um, uh, appearances for Portugal in the under-21s European Championships. Whether Nuno <laughs> uh, has much of a future at Arsenal, I think that is very much up for debate anyway. Uh, no Cedric Suarez. Uh, I think which says an awful lot about Cedric's um, uh, future at the club, shall we say, this season. Still got a year left in his contract. Did go to Germany, did play in Germany. Wasn't the greatest when he came on in that second half and hasn't made the squad. And I think you don't need to be a rocket scientist to work out what that means in terms of his prospects of playing much football for Arsenal this season, should he stick around. No Sambi Lekonga, of course. He's got his injury that he announced um, the muscular injury, so he hasn't gone. And there's a couple as well. Some of the younger players haven't travelled. Um, Ifo Ranieri, of course, Miles Luiskelli, both impressed in that trip uh, to Germany in their sort of little cameo they got at the end of that game. Only got 13 minutes, both of them, but they both played very, very well, made some, made a big impact. But they haven't gone. I'm not surprised, I have to say. I've had lots of questions from you guys saying, why haven't they gone? Like I said, this kind of mirrors what Mikel Arteta did last season with the US Tour. He took a fair few youngsters like Patino, like Salah, um, uh, Conquo, people like that. He took them to Germany last year. He played. They they got some minutes in the game against Nuremberg, but then they didn't go to the USA. And I was expecting Mikel to do something similar this time. And that's what happened. Uh, Kozia Dubry has gone. He's uh, headed off with the rest of the squad. If you watch on YouTube, see some of the pictures here of them on the plane on the way over there, looking very, very excited. Declan Rice, Leandro Trossard, Cozy Adubri. He's the one youngster who has gone. I think the difference with him is that there's no Reese Nelson in the squad. Again, we're not sure why yet. I can't answer for sure why Reese Nelson hasn't gone. Um, and Arsenal haven't said that they expect him to go out there. So whether he's picked up an injury, you would presume he probably has. Um, but Cozy Adubi, I kind of look at as cover for, for Reese. The fact that he hasn't gone there, um, you know, Cozy Adubi has made the squad because Reese isn't travelling. The rest of them, Wanieri and people like that, I just, I never really expected them to go, I have to say. And um, so, yeah, Cozy Adubi, the only youngster really who has made the squad. Um, looking forward to seeing he gets some minutes. If he does, he didn't go to Germany, so we didn't get to see him play in that game against Nuremberg. But 
um, while the young others impressed, but Cozy Dubry, Mikel Arteta really does like him. We saw him a lot in and around the squad towards the end of last season. And, um, you know, it was really, really impressive when I saw him in the, in the Youth Cup run. And he's scaringly close to Bakaya Saka in everything. When you look at him, when he, the way he runs, the way he plays on the pitch, everything about him, it's just like a mirror image of a younger Bakaya Saka. He's got the same mannerisms in the way he runs and everything. So it'll be interesting to see if he gets any sort of game time over in the US. I hope he does. I hope he gets a little bit of an opportunity to impress. Um, so the players have now arrived in Washington. They've had a little bit of a walk around. Declan Rice seems to be settling in very well. Martin Odegaard has travelled despite that injury issue that saw him miss the game against Nuremberg. Hopefully that is nothing too serious and he can play a part in all three of the fixtures that Arsenal do have coming up. We'll wait and see if Sinchenko gets any minutes. Arsenal was a little bit sort of keeping things a little bit careful when it came to Zinchenko with all the players who missed out the game against Nuremberg because of injury. Most of them were expected to potentially play in the first game of the US tour, but Arsenal have been a little bit more cautious with Zinchenko. Seem to think he might miss the next couple of games as well. The games Arsenal have got coming up on their US tour, it all kicks off on Thursday at 1.30 a.m. in the morning UK time. If you are planning on staying up or getting up and watching that one, that's against the MLS All-Stars, Wayne Rooney's MLS All-Stars, of course. Then the Manchester United game uh, on the Saturday and uh, then it all finishes with the game against Barcelona, which is a 3.30 a.m. kickoff UK time. That game against Barcelona over in the SoFi Stadium. Uh, in LA, Stan Kroenke's manner, of course. So yeah, really looking forward to this tour of the US. It went really, really well last last summer. Hopefully it does this time around. Some tricky, tricky games. That MLS All-Star game is always a really physical match. Whoever the All-Stars play, it's always a physical match. I remember Bayern Munich going over there uh, when uh, Pep Guardiola was in charge and Guardiola was not happy at some of the challenges that came flying in in that game. It means a lot to the All-Stars. It's not just a generic friendly. You know, they always want to work they always want to beat the teams they come up against. So I expect Arsenal will be coming in for a pretty physical battle in that one. They're going to have to be ready for it. And then, of course, yes, it's a friendly, but there's never really too much of a friendly when Arsenal play Manchester United. And, you know, the same goes for Barcelona as well. So really looking forward to these games. They're going to be really competitive. The Nuremberg game was very much a year classic pre-season friendly, but I don't think any of these... Um, these three that are coming up are going to mirror that sort of match. And Mikel Arteta is going to want to see a fair amount from his players. And I think we're probably going to see as the tour goes on, we're going to start seeing a little bit more of what Mikel Arteta has planned for those first games of the season. Because it's not long when they get back. You've just got the Monaco game on the Wednesday in the Emirates Cup. And then it's straight into the Community Shield against Manchester City. And I can't imagine that game against City is going to be uh, anything friendly that is going to be a very competitive match I think both teams are going to want to put down a little bit of a marker ahead of the new season you know if Arsenal could go into that game could get a win against Man City you know after so long without one I think that would give them such a massive boost ahead of the start of the new season so yeah it's going to be interesting as this tour goes on how much uh, we start seeing a um, little bit of a glimpse of what Mikel Arteta has planned for the early stages of the season Okay, so Flo Balogun, he's got nice new coloured hair by the looks of it in this picture, if you're watching on YouTube, sitting next to Bakaya Saka. Um, obviously, this is a big couple of weeks for Flo. He's heading over to the USA, where he's now the number nine striker. There's going to be lots of attention on him. I'm sure he's going to have a lot of media duties to do. It'll be interesting to see what he says about his future, if he ever does go and stand in front of a microphone, which I imagine he's going to probably have to at some point during this tour, just because of the nature of it all. He is being linked heavily with Inter Milan now. Now, Inter were expected to sign Lukaku. He spent last season there on loan, did all right, despite his uh, difficult night, shall we say, in the Champions League final against Manchester City. Um, but he was popular at, um, at Inter, and the ex expectation was they were going to get a deal done with Chelsea at about sort of 40 million to bring him back to the San Siro. That has now collapsed um, because they then in to strike a deal. Also, it seems like they're pretty annoyed that. Lukaku has been talking to Juventus as well about a potential mood. And now all the reports coming out of Italy are that Balogun is emerging as a real contender for Inter Milan in uh, for their to basically lead their front line alongside Lautaro Martinez next season. Now we know Arsenal want about £50 million for Balogun. Italian clubs are not exactly cash rich. They've all had their financial issues. Inter, of course, had a very, very good run making it to the Champions League final last season. That would have been pretty healthy for their bank balance. It remains to be seen if they can get anywhere near the 50 million 
that Arsenal would want for Flo Balogun. Of course, the fact that they didn't end up getting Lukaku is that they didn't get anywhere near really close to the valuation that Liverpool, uh, that Chelsea wanted for Lukaku. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see if that progresses. I mean, for Balogun, I imagine that would be a very, very appealing move. Should he leave this summer? And we all know it still feels like the expectation to me anyway is that he probably will go just because of everything we've discussed in previous episodes, his contract situation, his desire to really get regular minutes next season and not end up back on the bench after having such a good successful loan spell last season in France. That's a top, top club. I imagine there's lots about this potential move that would appeal to Flo Balogun. But the key thing is being able to strike a deal with Arsenal when it remains to be seen if Inter Milan can do that. I think, you know, 50 million, that's what Arsenal are potentially looking for. I don't think that necessarily what they'd end up accepting. I remember speaking on this show with Simon Collins at the standard. We were discussing it last week in one of the episodes and you know said 50 million might be a good starting point. If you set the bar at 50 million and they end up getting about maybe 40 million for Balogun, I don't think people would sort of turn their nose up on a fee like that for a player who's basically had one decent season out on loan in France. So maybe that would be something that Inter might be able to stretch to. We know there's other clubs who are looking at Balogun. He's a very uh, attractive proposition for several clubs this summer. RB Leipzig is certainly one who have been monitoring his situation. AC Milan, Inter's big, big rivals, are another club who are uh, have him on their radar. You know, it remains to be seen whether a big Premier League club or any Premier League club would potentially be interested in Balogun. I'd be surprised if no one's looking at him. You look at some of the teams that need a striker, Everton, West Ham, those sort of clubs, you think he could really tick the boxes for them and they would have the financial firepower, certainly West Ham to come in and potentially put an offer on the table that Arsenal find appealing. So we wait to see what happens on Balogun. But any, you know, any of your views, your comments on anything I've discussed so far on Balogun on the US tour, please do let me know what you think in the comments below. Another big potential sale for Arsenal this summer we know could well be Kieran Tierney. Nothing has really moved on in that regard yet. We were expecting at the end of last season, I certainly was, that it was going to end up being wrapped up pretty, pretty quickly with Newcastle. That hasn't happened. Newcastle kind of believed to be looking at other targets. You know, it's, I wouldn't say it's dead in the water yet. There's still an awful lot of time left in the transfer window. But, you know, I'm surprised that Kieran Tierney is still an Arsenal player at this point. There's been lots of talk about potential romantic storybook return to Celtic. Of course, the, play, the team that Arsenal signed him from, he's a Celtic boy at heart, Celtic fan, absolutely worships the football club. But could they be able to afford Kieran Tierney? A, the transfer fee that Arsenal want, and B, the wages that Arsenal want. Well, Brendan Rodgers, who is, of course, the manager while Tierney was at Celtic, the pair had a very, very good relationship. He has now gone back to Celtic after leaving Leicester, and he has been talking about the potential return of Kieran Tierney. This is what he had to say. He said, there have been lots of players linked with here, with me coming back. All I know is Kieran is like myself. We loved our time here. When I spoke to him down the road in the Premier League, every time we met up, all we talked about was Celtic. He's a Celtic man, but he's at a fantastic club in Arsenal. You can never say never in football. Who knows what might happen? We wouldn't be able to buy Kieran for 25 to 30 million. That's for sure. All the figures that I see banded about. I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be able to pay the huge salaries on. However, one can never tell. Well, Brendan, I think you kind of say it yourself there. If you wouldn't be able to pay the 25, 30 million pound and you wouldn't be able to pay his huge salary, then I'm not really sure what <laughs> what the uh, prospects, what sort of prospects are of Kieran Tinney returning to um, Celtic because one thing Arsenal aren't is a charity case they can't be giving Kieran Tierney back to Celtic um, so you know unless that's a little bit of a um, I don't know that's sort of Brendan Rodgers playing a few games there and not wanting to show Celtic's hand then I cannot see it happening just because of basically the reasons that Brendan Rodgers has said right there they can't afford him they can't afford the transfer fee they can't afford the wages then it's just not going to happen you know Arsenal cannot be giving Kieran T a player of Kieran Tierney's quality away for cheap, they've got to get market value. It's something they have to do this summer for so many of the, for these players if they are going to sell him. They've got to prove they can get market value. They've got to show they're not pushovers in the transfer market now when it comes to selling players. That era has to be moved away from. So you can't be doing anyone any favours, even if it is Kieran Tierney, a popular player in the squad. You can't be doing any any favours. You've got to get market value. And if you don't get it, then he sticks around and, he be, and he's a really important member in the squad next season because, you know, Arsenal could certainly do with Kieran Tierney next season, given the amount of games they're going to have to play in the Champions League, in the Premier League, in the Cup competitions. 
um, and he's a very, very good player. So, yeah, I think those comments from Brendan Rodgers said it all there, unless, as I said, he's playing a little bit of a game and keeping Celtic's hands a bit closer to their chests. All right, let's move on to some of your questions, shall we? Here's one from Graham Lynch. He says, hi, Charles, what's your opinion on needing cover for Ramsdale? An injury to him. I think we are in big trouble. It's an interesting one. I like Matt Turner. I think he's definitely it's it's he's definitely not as good as Aaron Ramsdale, that's for sure. So there's going to be a drop off. But I think with most clubs, if your first choice goalkeeper gets injured, there's definitely going to be a bit of a drop off. It's just the way of the world. So you've got to kind of cross your fingers a little bit and nothing serious happens to Aaron Ramsdale. I do think Matt Turner is a good goalkeeper, though. He's a very good shot stopper, yet he's not as good with the ball at his feet as Aaron Ramsdale. That's obvious. We've seen that whenever he's come into the Arsenal team. But I don't think he's a terrible goalkeeper by any by any means. I think his performances for the USA have proven that, both you know in recent games, but also at the World Cup, when I thought he was very, very good. When he comes into Arsenal, the few occasions he has played for Arsenal, obviously he's coming in, he's desperate to impress. Sometimes when you're like that, you can just be a little bit rash and make a couple of mistakes. I think if he, say, you got a sort of four, five, six game spell in the side, maybe he won't quite, quite be as nervous or won't but quite be in that mood where he's so desperate to take his opportunity that maybe a few mistakes creep into his game. So I, I don't think Arsenal really need cover for Ramsdale, certainly not this summer. I think there's other areas in the squad if they're going to spend some more money on, I think that's more a priority for me. I think Matt Turner could do a decent job if needed. Um, I don't think we've quite seen the best of him yet in an Arsenal shirt. Here's quite a long one from Wild Child. It says, I want to see Odegaard party Rice with party in his regular position and Rice in that box-to-box role on the left-hand side alongside Odegaard. I really think that would be something because Rice is the player who made the most ball winning in the defensive half and Odegaard is the one that made the most ball winnings in the offensive half. So what you have are two very mobile midfielders capable of winning the ball and pinning the opponents back. Odegaard and Rice have complementary attributes. You have the enforcer and the genius brain and hand. And then you have party behind them who at his best is just world class in my opinion on paper that looks like the best midfield in the league I just want to see it in practice now can't wait for pre-season look I agree I think that is and I've been saying it about why I'd prefer Thomas Partey to stay at Arsenal this summer rather than cash in on him as some of the reports have suggested um, I think that exact midfield as well is a really exciting one I'm not sure that's what Mikel Arteta has got planned I have to admit I think it'd be more if everyone's fit it'll be Rice at the holding role and then Havertz and Odegaard ahead of him but I think that one is a really interesting midfield especially for some of the bigger games you know you go to the Etihad or something like that you have party as a six and you have Rice ahead of him alongside Odegaard I think that just really strengthens the midfield a lot in those big away games when you need to wrestle a bit of control where Arsenal struggled at times to get control in the midfield like you said I think there's lots of attributes that really really work together there be a really strong midfield and um, it's a midfield three that I would really like to see next season so I agree with you 100% I think it's a really good comment wild child And um, yeah, it's something that I would absolutely like to see put into practice. Obviously, it's not going to be put in practice by the looks of it now for the first couple of games of the tour because party hasn't gone over to the USA, but hopefully we will see it very, very soon. Uh, Here's one from Swap and Jet Dash 987 says, Hi, Charles. Jeet here from India. Hello, Jeet. Uh, Hope you and your near ones are doing well. They are. Thank you very much. Just wanted to know your views on the wingers we have right now. I don't see anyone who could do the job Martinelli does, considering the other wingers we have are sort of inside forward. And do we have an interest in Dusan? I don't see us not creating chances. We will create many with everyone fit, but I don't see us converting half of those chances. Well, in terms of Dusan, no, I don't think Arsenal do. Obviously, he's been linked with Arsenal in the past heavily at times, although I was always told that that wasn't really one that was anywhere anything like as serious as some of the reports suggested. And I certainly don't think this summer the, that interest is there. I think it seems like if Dusan's going to go anywhere, it's going to be PSG, but we'll wait and see on that. Um, in terms of the wingers, look, I think Arsenal got some very good wingers. I agree, you know, if Martinelli's not there, most of them bring a li- something a little bit different. You look at Trossard, he likes to come inside. I think if you play Reese Nelson there, because he's naturally right-footed like that, the way he is, he likes to come inside as well. But I still think they're good options. Um, and I... I think if Arsenal have an area where they do need to improve, as I've said many, many times, it's over on that right-hand side. Just someone else who could come in and support or be cover a competition with Bagaya Saka. And that's something I'd really like to see later on in the window. If Arsenal can get some money in for some of these players we speak about um, as potential sales, then I would really like Arsenal to revisit that area as a potential area to strengthen. But in terms of on the left-hand side, I think Arsenal are pretty well stocked. And 
Um, even if Martinelli gets injured, I wouldn't be overly concerned. And I do think, like you said, yes, Arsenal, you know, is converting chances a bit of a problem. I think it's for most teams, unless you've got an absolute dynamite number nine up front. Um, you know, I don't think Dusan pulled up any trees when he was at Juventus by any means. So I'm not sure he's, abs- you know, guaranteed the answer should he have come in. Um, and I th- still think there's real scope for Gabriel Jesus scoring a, being a 20 goal striker next season. I really, really do. Um, and I think the amount of goals he scored when he came back from his injuries suggested that, you know, he ended up getting six in that little spell he had towards the end of last season, even if he wasn't playing as well as he was in the first half of the season before the injury. So um, I'm not, you know, I'm I, I'm still very confident that uh, Gabriel Jesus can really bang in the goals next season. Here's one from Scott says, just with what you were saying about next season, what's your expectations with what we spent? The owners now must be expecting a trophy at least this season. As you said, next season will be harder. Last time Chelsea played once a week, they won the league. The Spuds could be the same with Angie and Liverpool could get good again with that back three and Trent in the middle. All I want to see is nice football to watch every week. And if that means challenging the top four and a good run in the Champions League, I'd be happy. But that might not be enough for Arteta to keep his job come the end of the season. I think it would take an awful lot for uh, for Mikel Arteta to lose his job at the end of the season. I think if Arsenal got top four and had a good run in the Champions League, he would not be fired um, by any means. Whether he might look at it and think, you know, I've had a good go. I, I just don't know, but I don't think he'd get fired. I still think right now there'd be more likelihood of Arteta ended up sort of being poached somewhere else than him getting fired. I, you know, Arsenal, I think Arsenal would have to have an absolute car crash of a season for the owners to boot Arteta out. They're really, really happy with him. They really believe in the project. And I think there's a lot of realism at Arsenal that if you're going to win the, champ- the Champions League or the Premier League, you've got to have a very, very special season just because of the quality of the teams you're going up against. They were excellent last season, Arsenal, and they still didn't win it. Um, and that's because you're going up against arguably the best side ever in the Premier League. So I, if you're going into a season, your expectation is you have to beat Manchester City. I think you're barking mad, to be honest. You know, I hope Arsenal do it. And they're definitely going to be under more pressure to do it this season because of the scale of investment that they've done. But it doesn't matter how much money you spend. You've still got to beat Pep Guardiola and you've still got to beat Manchester City. And that is not easy. They've won the league five times out of the last six. They're going to be up there again this season. And and yeah, so I don't think missing out to Manchester City means you're going to be under pressure for your job. And I think the owners and the board and everyone at Arsenal will see that. So um, my expectations, look, I just I, th- I think you've got Arsenal have got to compete again for the title 100 percent. I think the level of investment means they have to. But I don't think if they come second that, you know, I'd be calling for Mikel Arteta's head. Or even if they came third, I'd be calling for Mikel Arteta's head. Like you, though, I want to see a good run in the Champions League. It's one thing we haven't really seen from Mikel Arteta yet. Yes, they got to the semi-final with the Europa League once under him. But knockout football, they have not been great under Arteta, especially in Europe. And that's something that he needs to show he can handle um, next season. So that's definitely something I want to see. A decent run, get through the group stages and then try and go as deep as you possibly can in that in that knockout rounds because I don't look at any to many teams in Europe and think Arsenal have got to be scared of them I really really don't and so I'd expect Arsenal to have a decent run next season in the Champions League all right that's it from me today everyone thank you very much for watching or listening wherever you're doing that around the world have a great start to your week I'll be back tomorrow to talk all things Arsenal and on Wednesday I think I'm gonna have a special guest appearance from James Benj of CBS I'm sure lots of you know of him uh, been on the Arsenal beat for a long, long time. Also covers you know the rest of football at the moment with his position at CBS. So if you've got any questions for myself or James, please do reply to them in the comments of this video on YouTube. I'll gather some of them together. and We'll have a good old Arsenal debate with James on Wednesday. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll speak to you very, very soon. <laughs>